It was eight years ago at a Landscape Institute conference where Tim Lang stood on a stage and started to talk about the importance of landscape, but particularly about the issues around our behaviour patterns and our environment, and basically that we were going to hell in a handcart. And I was sat in the audience, had come to listen to some sort of like sweeping statements around, you know, green and pleasant land, and suddenly thought, oh my God, he's right. You know, we've been thinking for a long time about the human impact on the world that we live in. And, you know, we've done not a right lot about it in terms of national policy or in terms of planning or whatever else it might be. So what could I do as an individual? What could we do as individuals in our own towns, in our own cities, in our own boroughs, whatever it might be, to see if we could, in our own small way, create gifts and give them to the children's future. Because fundamentally, we've been thinking for 20 odd years about the state of the planet and the environment and our health and obesity and all the rest of it. And the poor have got poorer and the rich have got richer and we've not done a right lot about it. So, rather than wait for someone on high to come and wave a wand and just decide that we can all make it better, what if we all individually started to think about living our lives differently? What if we could find a medium somewhere through which we could start to do things without asking for permission, without looking for a check, without any of the things that we've been taught we need in order to make progress? What if we could actually start to change the spaces of our lives by thinking about local food, to think about the skills that we've got and that we're passing on to our children, thinking about local food? And thinking about, when we're talking about sustainability and flying beans all over the planet or whatever else it might be, local economies, local food economies, keeping money sticky. What if in this mad experiment in a town like Tobedon, we could actually think that we could change the way that we live our lives and pass on something that's worth passing on to our children. We started the experiment eight years ago. We based it on a model that was invented on a virgin train in two hours by me and didn't consult anybody whatsoever about it, which was, let us imagine where we are, where we're going home to tonight, the place that we do our shopping or send our kids to school or nip to the health centre or whatever it might be. What if we made everything around our lives edible. Is it possible that would change the way we think? Well, first of all, it seems a little bit bonkers. But then again, the last eight years have thrown up some most remarkable experiences that led me to believe that it is entirely possible, if human beings use the gifts that they've got, that we can create a kinder, more respectful future. And we can build resilience from the bottom up without a right lot of money. And whereas eight years ago, not that many people wanted to talk to us about it, now when nobody's got any money to do everything, everybody wants to talk to us about it, which is fantastic. So here's the model. It used to be three spinning plates, because I was quite affected by the idea of, you know, the, the spinning plates in the circus, which was a point about if you spin a community plate, then you've got a learning plate, and then you've got a business plate, and you've got food at the heart of them all. Individually, it could be quite exciting, but collectively, it's a heck of a show. And then I suddenly thought, well, actually, what this is all about is creating a bigger picture by each and every one of us doing our own thing. So actually, it's a jigsaw. It's not a spinning plate show. So let's imagine that we make up this model with food at the heart of it, entirely bottom up, asking nobody's permission, not waiting for a check, forget about local government, they'll come in eventually, and national government, I think, will follow them. What if community had edible landscapes? What if learning was about the skills that we used to remember and also the skills we'll need in the future if we're going to be urban farmers? What if it was about soil science? What if it was about aquaponics? What about our schools actually teaching things that will be really useful in 30 years' time? Business. What about if we could start to create local jobs for our kids that, that, that were meaningful and that, you know, so that they could imagine they've got a really worthwhile enterprise that they themselves had invested in and the community wanted to support? If we spin all those things together, can we build resilience? Can we redefine regeneration? Can we start to think about the landscapes of our lives? And the answer is, of course, we can. So here's a few pictures of what we've done over the last eight years. We take something which is the top right-hand corner, which is a horrible dog toilet. It was one of the first things we ever did. Basically, it was a space, it was a verge, we've all got them. The council just hasn't got any money, didn't have any money eight years ago and has even less now. And instead of it being full of litter cans and fag ends and God knows what else, it's actually now, through the community coming forward, just putting their rubber gloves on, cleaning up all the mess and planting edibles, it's full of herbs, it's full of cherry trees, it's full of all manner of things. And it's a space that now is loved by that community and the local authority put that bench in there one and a half years later so that the community could enjoy it because the local authority is there to do the right thing. It's just nine times out of ten, it doesn't quite know how to say yes. Then another one was around the health centre and this is a no-brainer. If you've got a health centre, which we've got there, which is six, seven, eight million pounds, whatever it was, and I had a look at some health centres out there in your exhibition and they're still surrounded by inedible prickly plants. What's that about? But anyway... Instead of landscaping them with these things that you can't actually eat, why don't we landscape them with things that you can eat? 
because it's a health centre. You know, the key is on the tin. So basically, we've got families from some of the poorest, commun poorest communities walking through to the health centre, and instead of popping pills, they might think, oh, that's how raspberries grow, or, oh, oh, I'll pick a strawberry and eat it, or, oh, oh, they're interested in herbs, and that's an apothecary garden up at the top that used to be a car park. We asked their permission, and they said we could shift it as long as it didn't cost them any money and the doctors didn't have to do it, so we did it ourselves. And now we've created an edible landscape around that health centre. That should be what happens in every single health centre. It doesn't cost you any more money. It's just about having the will to be different. And here we've got a job centre. Now, bless them, you've lost your job, you've got no money, you're, you know, you're, you're on the skids and you've got to walk past that bare tarmac every day of your flipping life. What is that about? So, the health centre said, would you mind if we actually put, you know, can we, can we work with you on an um, edible landscape? We said, that's fantastic. So, in the middle of winter, in a snowstorm, we ourselves, at no cost to the Department of Work and Pensions, built that. Why did we build it? Is it the most wonderful, fabulous thing you've ever seen? Of course it's not. But is it possible that somebody might be inspired to say, A, I've got some spare time and I've got a backyard so I might as well grow in it. Or B, why don't I think about reskilling because people have got to eat and maybe I'd like to do something around that. It's just about stories. It's just about conversations. It's just about saying to each and every one of you, do you know, don't listen to the sophisticates who say it's too difficult and you can't do it because you can. And collectively, we can make a huge difference in this world. And if we've created edible landscapes and propaganda gardens all over the place, which are not about feeding 15,000 people in the town, but are about starting a conversation about the future we want, what we want our spaces to look like, what we want out of our public realm, what we want our schools to be. If you start that conversation, and there's no better way to start it than by creating edible landscapes, then the obvious next question is, so what shall I do? What do I need to learn? If I want orchards everywhere, but I can't afford it because I've got no money in my community, I'll do a regrafting course. So we've got people who can graft and they show people how to graft trees and they can put uh, orchards down for much less money. Or we're showing people how to take the seeds and loads of people have got spare seeds in bottom drawers that they end up throwing out. We give them to young people, they start to plant them up. Or we rack up the street and just talk to people in the middle of winter or whatever it might be about how to make a tomato soup or a pumpkin squash or whatever else it might be. Because so many people have no idea. They might be able to learn how to grow things, but they don't know how to cook things, and they might only have a microwave, and you've got to work from where people are. But collectively, suddenly you're getting engagement. You get an engagement around thinking about jobs, and this young person down there on the left is one of the apprentices that's come up through one of our social enterprises. And what happens is, once you've got people seeing their own self-interest and their own future defined through a different public realm or private realm, they start to get interested in planning. And suddenly you've got a great opportunity through the Edible Neighbourhood Plan to actually start people thinking about what do I want where? Where shall I start to process it? What do I want in my local market? Hey, we need extensions to that. How do we make the connection with the farming community? Suddenly, people who were detached from the place that they live in become attached because it's about their future which they can understand because it's about food because basically we all do food if you eat you're in it's a no-brainer if you started with peak oil on this one i'd still be in a very dark corner not speaking to anybody but because it's food suddenly everybody engages and the neighborhood planning process is a fabulous way to do it so out of that comes confidence. Out of those simple propaganda gardens comes confidence and we start to create social enterprises that employ people. And these are both run by communities themselves, one in partnership with the school, the other one just the broader partnership of farmers and the local people. And they are teaching people how to redefine the spaces of their lives and the skills in their lives and the, their futures in a way that wasn't happening before. And it's all done by volunteers and it's all on a, on a wing and a prayer. And we never ask permission for doing nine things out of 10, but we seem to have got somewhere because a hundred and odd communities in this country are doing it and communities all over the world are. Not because we know how to grow things, but because we're defining our future through the public spaces and the private spaces of our lives. And that's all this is about. You can tackle poverty from the grassroots up. Just do it one plot at a time. Thank you.